So welcome back. Um, I would I would happily like to welcome our first keynote speaker tonight, today, sorry, um, who all, most of you already know, Mario Carpo. Uh, I'll make, I'll do my best to introduce him, uh, which is not such an issue thing after such a life of accomplishments, readings, writings, and contributions to, to this field. Uh, Mario Carpo, uh, after studying architecture and history in Italy, Dr. Carpo was an assistant professor at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, uh, and in 1993 received tenure in France, where he was first assigned to the École d'Architecture de Saint-Étienne, and then to the École d'Architecture de Paris-Laville. He was the head of the study center at the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal from 2002 to 2006, and Vincent Scully, visiting professor of architectural history at the Yale School of Architecture from 2010 to 2014. Mr. Carpo's research and publications focus on the relationship among architectural theory, cultural history, and the theory of media and information technology. His award winning in architecture in the age of printing has been translated into several languages, his most recent books being The Alphabet and the Algorithm and the Digital Turning Architecture from 1992 to 2012. Um, I have been recently drawn to his readings, um, and this is a, probably like a personal view on it, mostly because of his um, historical rigor mixed with his literacy in writing, his humanity in that purpose, and I would also say his provocations. My view on this field of the theory of digital design is that we need people who offer definitions and we also need people who challenge them. So I think he's actually a really good exponent for both, this, both of these sites. And um, he also made a remark before. Um, he was kind enough to say that he didn't remember what was going on, but there was like quite a lot of excitement and controversy uh, after his last intervention here, I would like to remind him that he actually bet one dollar with certain GSD professor that he would offer a good explanation interpretation for some of Alberti's books. So maybe you can elaborate on that after the, after the talk. His lecture today is going to be called Computation, Simulation, Optimization, and the New Style of Big Data. So well, help me welcome him in our lecture tonight. Thank you for this very generous introduction. Now I've changed my glasses, and I cannot see the audience anymore, but you can still see me, right? Doesn't work. Good. And you can perhaps even hear me, can you? Good. So thanks again. Thanks for calling me here. Always a pleasure. I have splendid memories of the last time I was in this room, as you were pointing out. I'm a bit jet lagged, so I may fall asleep while reading my paper. But if that happens, I've got coffee ready on the table. So um, let me start with a disclaimer. Everyone is talking about big data. We have been talking about big data in this room right now. There is no consensus on what big data means. And the term is used today in many different fields to mean many different things. In today's global media, the term big data is mostly used to refer to the capacity that some organizations have acquired to collect and exploit huge amounts of data, which they use to pry and spy into our personal lives to make outstandingly accurate, almost miraculous predictions on all kinds of social and even personal events. This is the dark, threatening side of big data. This big data has big brother, and everyone is afraid of that. Yet, in the design professions, we tend to have a much friendlier view of big data. As we all know, the digital avant-garde 
has embraced the power of today's digital computation with great creative enthusiasm and with few political or ethical reservations. Today, even more than in the 90s, big data and computation in design are seen as a tool to create, calculate, and fabricate even freer and more complex architectural and structural forms. And this is often seen by the digital avant-garde as a liberatory and even a libertarian approach to design, a way to cope, manage, and even extol the capacity of some emergent or morphogenetic systems to self-organize above or beyond our traditional methods of design and control. This, what you see on the screen, is not a snapshot I took on the beach. It's a work by Theos Pyropoulos. And not surprisingly, today's digital avant-garde often inclines towards a neo-romantic styles, sometimes neo-naturalistic. Thus, what you see on the screen is not a flower pot on my windowsill. It is a digital work by Francois Roche, sometimes neo-expressionistic, sometimes biomimetic, and often a celebration of the complexity and indeterminacy of the vitality and animation of inorganic matter. And you may have seen this or something similar to this in this very room half an hour ago. Evidently, this vitalistic and indeterministic view of big data, which is frequent today among the design professions, is the opposite of the hyper-deterministic view of big data that is common among economists and social scientists. And there is a paradox here because in the social sciences, big data is seen as a tool to predict and determine the behavior of humans. Whereas in the natural sciences, big data is used to give life to nature, almost to animate inorganic matter. So on the one hand, we use big data to make human life more predictable, more deterministic. On the other hand, we use the same big data to make nature less predictable and more indeterminate. At the origin of this bizarre paradox, and to go back to where it all started, it may be worth asking, what did big data originally and technically mean? Now take a deep breath and bear with me because this is going to require a long and somewhat boring digression. In its most elementary technical meaning, the big data phenomenon simply refers to our capacity to collect, store and process increasing amounts of data. If that is so, let me proceed to a bold extrapolation. Because to the limit, this may mean that ideally, at some point in the future, an almost infinite amount of data can and probably will be recorded, transmitted and retrieved at almost no cost. Note that I said almost twice, in the first line and on the last line. Because this state of zero cost recording and retrieval will always be technically impossible. But this is the trend, this is the tendency. And the trend is going asymptotically this way. An equally simple technical side effect of this trend is that many traditional technologies of data compression will soon become unnecessary, as the cost of compressing the data and occasionally losing some in the process will be more than the cost of keeping the data as found in its original state and for a very long time, even forever. If we say today data compression technologies, we think immediately of JPEG or MP3. But let's think outside of the box for a second and let's have a look at the bigger picture. If we step back from our immediate technological present, we cannot fail to notice that so many technologies we use, 
including many cultural technologies that have been with us for a very long time, should be seen today as data compression technologies we invented over time to cope with a chronic shortage of data and of data processing power. Small data was, until very recently, an inevitable material condition affecting all human endeavors at all times and in all places. Data has always been difficult to find and expensive to keep and process. Today, this chronic, chronic shortage of data all of a sudden has just ceased to be. Today we have plenty of data which cost almost nothing. As a result, many cultural technologies we used in the past, which we used to compress data, are now technically obsolete and we just don't, don't need them anymore. Let me show just a few evident, well-known examples. And the first in the list is one which I remember mentioning in this room the last time I was here. So let me repeat myself briefly to the benefit of those that were not here on that memorable day. Think of one of those, one ingenious invention of Baroque mathematics, logarithms, which translate big numbers into small numbers and the other way around and crucially translate the multiplication of two big numbers into the addition of two small numbers. Laplace, who was the favorite mathematician of Napoleon I, famously said that logarithms, by reducing to a few days calculation that would have taken many months, doubled the life of the astronomer. And we could add today, logarithms extended the life of many 20th century engineers who, using a logarithmic slide rule like this one, could calculate almost everything in a matter of seconds. Now, would the use of logarithms and of logarithmic tables extend the life of my computer today? Not really. Normal desktop computers today are so powerful but a few more digits in a number or a few more multiplication in a line or script do not really make any difference in the sense that computation would not cost more or take longer because of that. So not surprisingly, today's engineers do not use logarithms any longer. Logarithms are a technology of data compression which was very useful when it was invented but which is useless today and we don't need it anymore. To take another example closer to the daily life of the design <laughs> professions, scale drawings in plans, elevation and sections, parallel projections, have been the basic tool of the designer's trade since the Renaissance. And the geometrical rules of parallel projections were famously published in 1799 by Gaspar Monge under the name of descriptive geometry. Descriptive geometry is a fantastic data compression technology because it uses parallel projections to compress 3D into 2D and to convert big 3D objects into a set of small flat drawings, which can be kept on simple sheets of paper. In this instance, the compression of data is almost a visible and physical one. No one could store the Seagram building. In reality, it's quite a big building. But using Gaspar Monge descriptive geometry, we can compress the whole building onto a batch or a roll of blueprints and put the whole building into a drawer. This is indeed the way the Seagram building was built half a century ago. And using the same blueprints, which still exist somewhere, we could rebuild it, if necessary, just the same. Today, however, Using digital technologies, we can store not only a huge number of planar drawings, but also full 3D models of buildings on a single memory chip, including all the data we need to simulate that building in virtual reality or to build it in full. And designers can already work in 3D and avoid the mediation of planar drawings and of orthographic projections, plans, elevation, and sections. In short, 
Descriptive geometry is another cultural technology for data compression already on the way out. And in case you haven't noticed, a few schools of architecture still seem to be teaching it. I don't know what that means. In other instances, the mode of use of today's big data tool has already led us to abandon ways of thinking that were so deeply embedded in history that we would have thought them timeless and universal. Think of this one. Think of Gmail's original motto, don't sort, search or search, don't sort, which when Google Mail or Gmail was launched in 2004, meant that we shouldn't put messages into folders the way we did it, we shouldn't sort, we could keep email incoming, outgoing, as they came, without any order. Because when we would need it to retrieve one, a simple search using the power of Google search on keywords or on words or in alphabetical letters would find just the message we were looking for. So no need to sort because search can replace sorting. That was 2004 when it was. Now they admit some kind of sorting even inside Gmail, but the logic is still basically the same and it works. Now, since the beginning of time, classification or sorting has been our tool of choice for information retrieval. We put things in certain places, following some order, so we know where to look for them when we need them. Also, more generally speaking, the idea that we must sort and classify events in order to make some sense of the world goes back to Aristotle, and it is at the basis of most of Western philosophy and science. But Google is training us to leave documents unsorted because digital search is now so fast that there is no need to manually pre-sort documents. This principle needs not be limited to media objects. It may extend to physical objects of all kinds, which can be tagged and tracked using radio frequency identification. This may apply to random junk in a garage, to books in a library, or to the full inventory of Amazon.com, which is indeed what is happening, because items of all sorts in Amazon warehouses, including books, are not sorted based on subject or category, as a library would do, but only based on the frequency of sale, following an order which would be perfectly meaningless to a human mind. Using the same technical logic, in our houses, in our daily life, we could keep potatoes and socks and books and fish in the same drawers, or indeed anywhere. We would not need to remember where we put things or where things are, because whenever we need them, we could simply Google them in physical space and perhaps use Google Glasses to do so. Now, this is one instance where Google Glasses would have been quite useful. And in fact, I am certain we shall see some of that come back at some point. Now, another step. The same Google logic from media object to physical objects to space needs not be limited to space because it may also apply to time. Imagine that if every event that ever happened can be recorded, searched and retrieved, in many cases, the search for an exact precedent may replace many other technologies of prediction, including, let me proceed to a bold, um, to a long shot here, including nothing less than modern science in its entirety. And indeed, in some fields of predictive science, from weather forecasting to material sciences, information retrieval has already replaced the traditional analytic cost-to-effect approach of modern science. And many scientists have already come to the conclusion that sometimes, instead of calculating results based on mathematical functions and laws of causation, it is easier to assume that whatever happened before, 
if it has been recorded, if it can be retrieved, will simply happen again, whenever the same conditions reoccur. This is, in a sense, the real spirit of big data. And it is not very different philosophically from what Galileo and Newton also thought. But Galileo and Newton did not have big data. In fact, often they had very little data indeed. So they had to proceed in ways that were different from what we can do now. Let me show with an example the difference between the modern science of small data, whereby I mean Galileo, and the postmodern science of big data, whereby I mean us today. Galileo made plenty of experiments to study the breaking of beams under load. And we have, by a lucky coincidence, already seen a picture from the same book earlier on this very screen, just one hour ago. Galileo famously published some of his results in his last book, titled On the Two New Sciences of Mechanics and Local Motions, printed in 1638. It was printed in Leiden, in the Low Countries, not in Tuscany, where Galileo then lived, because Galileo, as you may remember, had had some problems with the Inquisition. And so all the books he wrote, never mind the subject, would be burnt if found in Tuscany, together with the person carrying them. <laughs> so the book left Tuscany in the uh, diplomatic case of a Dutch ambassador. It was carried to Leiden, where it was printed in a Protestant country. But it was still about two new signs of mechanics and local motions. Today, we need not repeat any of Galileo's experiments, nor any other experiment, to determine how most beams will break, because generalizing from Galileo's experiments and from many more that followed, we have obtained some very general laws that predict the structural behavior of most standard beams under most standard loads. These formulas that all engineering students learn in two weeks and then remember for life, or they remember or they forget in two weeks, it depends which one applies, describe in a few clean lines of mathematical script all the beams that broke in the past and all that will break in the future in certain given conditions. This is how modern science works, or rather worked till now. Four, let's put ourselves in a big frame, big data frame of mind. And let's assume, again pushing the argument to the limit, that we can have access to a universally searchable digital archive of all structures ever built, where all life events, so to speak, occurring to any structure ever built are recorded in full, from design and construction to collapse or destruction. It's not science fiction. It is science fiction if applied to building. But in the case of um, aircraft engineering, this is already happening. Now, in that case, the best way to design a new beam would be to search for the record of a very similar one that was built in the past and replicate that design if we are satisfied with its historical performance. Thus, a simple search would replace all predictive science, and we could design the safest possible beam based on evidence of historical precedent without any engineering calculation, any science, any science, any mathematics, nothing. Just, just, just retrieval. So no science, just Google. Don't calculate, search. Does that sound like a practical joke? Well, it shouldn't, for this is what we have been doing for the last few years, thanks to the power of today's digital computation, only in a slightly different way, and often without knowing it, or sometimes without saying it. Let me show that with another real-life example. Recent technical developments on the extrusion and the robotic weaving of very thin filaments have prompted promising design experiments, such as those recently pursued at the Bartlett, where I teach, by 
Elise Andrusek, Marcos Cruz, Daniel Vridrig, and others. And also um, by Aki Menges at the University of Stuttgart, Stuttgart, and probably also here. Now, Aki Menges, Ian Knippers, and their research group have recently published a technical article explaining how they calculated a thin shell made with two kinds of fiber reinforced polymers for a pavilion they built in 2012. Uh, this is not a digital rendering. Uh, it looks like a digital rendering, but it's a photograph. This was actually built. Well, I have no evidence of that, but someone told me that it was, so let's believe it. Now, in the case of this pavilion, structural calculations had to take into account the geometry of the shell, which is fairly complicated, as well as the density and the direction of each bundle and layer of carbon fibers and also of glass fibers, because there are two materials. I presume the carbon fibers are black and the black fibers are white, and they are wound together. Now, in that article, the, uh, the authors explained how they did it. They started with a geometrical and material layout inspired by biological models. This would be the picture on the left bottom. I don't know which kind of animal that is, but must be some kind of beast. So, and they started with that from the um, structure of the shell. Then they simulated the structural behavior of the first model of their own pavilion using standard computational finite element analysis. Based on the results of this first simulation, some aspects of the design were randomly tweaked, changing both the geometry of the shell and the internal layout of the fibers. The finite element analysis simulation was then rerun on the second model, and then again and again. The process was repeated many times over until the authors were pleased with the results. In this process of optimization by trial and error, every simulated model that was tested and discarded corresponded to a physical model, which in this case was not made, but which a traditional artisan working without digital tools would have made, tested, and likely broken in real life. Using digital simulations of structural performance, however, today we can make and break on the screen in a few hours more full-size trials than a traditional craftsman would have made and broken in a lifetime. Artisans of pre-industrial times were not engineers, so they did not use mathematics to predict the behavior of the structures they made. When they had talent, they learned by intuition by trial and error, by making and breaking as many samples as possible. Well, so do we today using digital simulations. We may or may not intuit some patterns, regularity or logic inherent or embedded in the stru structure we are tweaking. But that is irrelevant because by making and breaking in simulation a huge number of variations, at some point we shall find one that does not break. And that would be the good one, the one we were looking for. This trial and error design process, in the case of Akin Menges, was famously inspired by Fry Otto's method of physical form finding. But it is also very similar to the big data search and retrieve alternative to modern science I just mentioned. Whenever digital tools allow us to collect, record, and process, huge throws of data, information retrieval, the search for a precedent, is more effective than the traditional application of analytic predictive laws of causation. In the case of the 2012 pavilion, the structure was an experiment without precedent. Hence, no corpus of previous comparable instances was available for search and retrieval. In the absence of any such historical archive, the authors just made one up. They made it up themselves. Using the power of digital simulation, they created virtually just the historical archive they would have needed. 
and which did not exist because the things we were designing had no precedent. So they created a huge number of fictional simulated precedent out of thin air. Simulation. They may not have seen it this way, but by simulation and iteration, or iteration, they in fact generated a vast and partly random corpus of many very similar structures, but all failed under certain conditions, and they chose and ultimately built one that didn't. This is a far cry from how a modern engineer would have designed that structure, which is one reason why no modern engineer could have designed it. A modern engineer would have started with a set of formulas, establishing causal relationships between loads, forms, and stresses in the structure. These formulas are typically used to calculate the resistance of a structure after it has been designed. But they often also drive and inspire our first intuitive sketch of it. This is because causal laws, I mean L-A-W-S, laws. Um, when I say that in England, they tell me how to say laws. But if I say law, uh, laws, L-A-W-S, sorry, let me restart. This is because causal laws make sense somehow. By the causality they express, they interpret and provide some understanding of the physical phenomena they describe. Indeed, in the classical scheme of things, in classical science, causality is seen as a law of nature. So we like to think that the laws of mechanics, for example, spell out in mathematical terms the way that beams, cantilever, pillars, arches, or vaults function in reality. And the formulas of structural engineering have a meaning which we think is true to nature. Indeed, this meaningfulness and the structural theories underpinning it are visible in all the masterpieces of modern structural engineering, from Eiffel's tower to Nervis vaults. If we look at these modern structures, we understand the basic structural principles that designers had in mind when they first sketched them. That does not apply to our current way of designing by form finding, or as I would say, to better demarcate the computational nature of today's process from Fry Otto's precedent, I would call it form searching. The power of big data applied to information retrieval and simulation makes the mathematical formulas at the core of modern structural engineering as obsolete as the yellow pages or as the logarithmic tables which were still included in many engineers' pockets books which were still in use when I was a student, such as this one. Now, if you see it on the screen, you do not realize the size, but I can tell it was a pocket book. So it was indeed made for pockets. You could put it into the pockets of, a, let's say, a big tweed jacket. Now that I think of it, tweed jackets don't exist anymore as well. So they might have gone in the similar process of decline. But through computational form searching, we can today design new structures of unimaginable complexity. But precisely because it is unimaginable, this post-human complexity belies interpretation and transcends the small data logic of causality and determinism we have invented over time to simplify nature and convert it into transparent, human-friendly models of causality. Why does this unimaginable complex structure stand up? And thousand very similar ones we just run through structural simulations don't? Who knows? But the point is it that works and that Using digital tools, this is the best 
uh, possibly the only way we can work today. And these are my last words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, I just have so many things to say and so little time, but um, I'll just try to resume what I got from your provocative lecture today. I seem to have noticed uh, a provocation in you being, especially when you mentioned the fact that you believe that um, big data is not anymore about the data itself, but it's more about our capacity to apprehend and to manipulate that data. Um, I think that that's actually a really interesting concept. I think it may relate to the fact that, and this is probably a question, like do you think data is something that's out there, that's, already, that's always been out there? Because you mentioned big data drives nature. And I wonder if data is something that's already been out there. And the fact that we call it big now, is just because we just technically and conceptually just began to realize that we can now fetch it, we can manipulate it, and we can understand it in a better way. And we realize that's actually big. It may be infinite, but it may be non-existent. I don't know. Which one should I use? This one? Yeah. Yes, data was always out there. But before we had the technical, hence the cultural capacity to understand that data was, could be collected, stored, processed, recorded, and transmitted, the fact that it was out there was culturally and even scientifically irrelevant. No one would dream of collecting data which would be lost after collection. In a sense, the amount of data which is out there, I think it is always paradoxically equal to the amount of data we can store. And so the amount of data we can glean from the observation of nature has been growing exponentially in the last 10 years because we, can re we now realize that we can not only glean this data, we can do something with it. For example, we can record and transmit data, whereas the simple, banal recording and transmission of even very plain alphabetical or number-based information in the past was, think, before the invention of print, even taking down a few lines of script. You could take them down, but you could be certain that at the first copy, they would be lost and transmogrified, and they would become who knows what. And so there is a certain inevitable feedback loop between the cultural awareness of data out there and the technical availability of the possibility of doing something with them. So my guess is that we automatically adapt our notion of the datability of the environment based on the usability of the data we can glean, which is why we are now for the first time realizing, for the first time ever, that there is no practical limit already in many practical activity of daily life to the amount of data we may want to glean because there is no cost limit in the amount of data we can after that use. And this is, I mean, it's the first time this happens since probably the invention of alphabetic writing. Hmm. <laughs> I was really drawn when you, when you offered the, the, um, the cover of the Wire magazine in 2007, which, in which it was already starting to suggest that science was not anymore about like this, para, this Afro, like, this really concise, elegant formula, but it was more about like um, the whole complexity of... Um, that cover was a great invention of Chris Anderson, who was at the time the director of Wired. And he had this notion, and he formulated it actually quite smartly in the PC route in that issue of Wired. But then all the articles that the Wired writers put together to corroborate his argument didn't because he was ahead of his time. And so his intuition was very good, but the people working around him didn't get it at the time. Um, 
now it is becoming so evident, but even mainstream epistemologists and historians of science are trying to come to terms with this paradigm shift. Chris Anderson is not any longer, now he's building drones. You know, that's what he's doing. He's founded a company, he's building drones for the army, I don't know what. I didn't know that. Maybe he wasn't in touch with Stephen Wolfram, who was already writing about big data and emergence in the world of science back in the times. <laughs> Good point, because cellular automata are, would be here a big footnote, which I didn't read because you don't read footnotes in a paper you present. In a, but <laughs> that's a good point. Um, since we don't have much time, we may open these two questions from the audience. Anybody would like to? Can I have a provocation? Yes, please. Um. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I have a, a, just a small provocation. Um, and I own it to my master, Jean Piaget. Uh, who was resistant in thinking about knowledge itself as information and as uh, intelligence as information processing, but who was defining human intelligence as adaptation and adaptation as trying to opening up to the maximum of possibilities while at the same time uh, retaining the maximum of pre-established order in order to be able to uh, be, vi be viable in one's environment. So it's a very different approach because one is more the information processing paradigm and the other is more biologically grounded versions. And um, at least because I come from this background, each time when I read a paper that starts with, we are inundated by all this information nowadays, as if it had not been the case before, I cannot not put on my Piaget hat and saying, the world is by definition not filled with information that we encode, uh, put in, mem in memory boxes, retrieve, and then reapply somewhere else. And intelligence is the possibility to apply in another context or generalize. But it has a lot to do with precisely um, with the capacities of selecting the kinds of beep, 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 beeps that the too complex environment gives us in order to just take the next step to try to keep our own equilibrium. I am being too long, but I just, my little provocation is, I think that you have paid a lot of attention to the ways in which the tools we use actually shift this balance that we try to establish, but I am just curious whether how you respond to this um, malessere that I, at least I have when I start an, an article, you know, that states to begin with that the world is much more complex now and we have much more possibility to actually glean on this kind of information. This malessere is I think inevitable insofar as the tool we are using have adopted a logic which is not the one we use. We need classification to remember where we put things and to make some sense of the world. We need causality to interpret the working of natures. But computers do not need to interpret the world, they just measure it. In a sense, all the stuff I've been describing is all the stuff that Computers do well, but humans don't like. The human mind is hardwired for small data. And computers work in a different way. So the, the story of Stephen Wolfram is, is, is uh, emblematic. First, he spent the first part of his life 
making computers use the mathematics we invented during uh, the mathematics of modern science. And he translated all the mathematics of modern science in a way that computers could use it, providing user-friendly interfaces. And then he came to the conclusions that computers actually work better in a different way. And he wrote another book titled A New Kind of Science, where he explains that if you really want to use computers, yes, computers can simulate modern mathematics, which is made by us, which is made for us to interpret, to understand, to, to, to come to terms with the works of nature, which computers do not do and do not need to do, because computers just measure things, and if you want to use computers according to a logic, which is inherent in their technical logic, then you should let them work their own way. And he came up with cellular automata, a new kind of science, which is, in a sense, an argument which is very similar to the one I was making. There is a logic, which is the logic of the tool, which is now going in a completely different direction relative to the direction that the human mind has been developing from Aristotle till yesterday. It's a bit apocalyptic, and of course, this kind of apocalyptic conclusions, which are based on extrapolation of very recent events, hopefully will be you know, um, adjusted <laughs> in time. But for the time being, it's worrying and, um, and promising at the same time. It's good. Thank you much, so much for the lecture. I would have one question. If you, if you would, uh, if you would also uh, uh, say that uh, the article from Wired was uh, entitled "The End of Theory." Is it also the end of architectural theory? And if you could illustrate, if if this is the case, what what what, what kind of impact would it have? Which kind of end would you want now? The end of architectural <laughs> theory. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is what we are doing here today. So if we proclaim the end of that, we should go out and drown ourselves in the charts. That's the name of a local river, right? <laughs> no, no, let's not go into that. Let's opt for survival. <laughs> Just a thought or comment uh, on this great lecture. In computation, there's still the rule, garbage in, garbage out. Now, I think big data begins to challenge that, at least that's the hope, because there's so much of it that all the flaws somehow will be ironed out, right? Now, I think it's still, to some degree, hypothesis, but I very much enjoyed you taking on the issue of structure, so I happen to be very interested in it, and I teach it, so uh, I imagine I'll just be teaching data analysis, uh, well, I won't be teaching anymore 20 years down the road, but maybe that's what will be happening in the classroom. But uh, with structures, one of the issues is that the data, for the most part, is very bad, right? Because if structures right now is creating a model of the building to, to, to essentially understand the behavior, um, then the one part we don't have in terms of data is, is the kind of environmental influences, right? They're just nothing, right? So I'm just putting this out there. I think there's lots of room for research in this area. I could completely see this happening. When you have good data, I think a researchable question for me would be to what degree can we actually do this with bad data? Um, and the other part of my comment is you showed a couple of buildings, one by Achim Menges, then by Frau Otto. I think they're fundamentally different buildings. Uh, I think Fai Otto was actually very new, even though there were a few smaller precedents for that system. Um, it was new, whereas Achim Menges, I think, is uh, essentially is a relatively simplified application of known principles of composite structure in this particular system. So I, I, I'm not sure there's new aspects of engineering in terms of composite design. Uh, but going back on to Fai Otto's work, it was actually new in a sense, as a material system, as a morphology, as a structural approach. Uh, and for me, it's still a question whether can big data actually allow and support that kind of work that really goes beyond a known threshold of known approaches and really goes into an entirely new territory, which in a way is also what we should try to strive at as, 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 as designers, as, as people that create the built environment to also allow that kind of innovation to happen. So I don't know, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on it.
On your first point, a very good point, a, a, a big difference between the small data tradition of science and the big data environment to which we are trying to get used is that when data had to be very limited, when we had only a few of them, we wanted them to be as precise as possible. So we culled them carefully, we selected them, and we required extreme accuracy because we had to cope with very few of them and we wanted them to be good, which is exactly the opposite of the philosophy of big data. There are so many of them, but if a few are off the mark, they will self-correct. And so we can accumulate them, in a sense, indiscriminately, which is quite the opposite. We tend to think that digital technologies are about precision. This is quite the opposite. Digital technologies, in this case, allow us to cope with approximation. So it is, in a sense, Alexandre Coiré in reverse. With modern science, we move from approximation to precision, and with postmodern computation and simulation, we are going back to the capacity to cope with the approximation of the world in which we live. Precision is no longer necessary because our tools are so powerful that we can cope with the randomness, with the accidentality, which is a general pattern. Um, as for your, your, your second point, what was interesting in that pavilion by Aki Menges, um, was that he published, and that was my discovery, he sent it to me, a, a technical article mostly written by his engineering associate, where they explained what they did because that pavilion had to stand up, it had to be tested according to German standards. And so they did it all according to the books. And so it was certified, it had the rubber stamp, uh, it, would, it could stand up, it was legal in a sense. But then they had to explain in a technical article, which was not published in an architectural journal, but in a publication of engineering, how they did it in engineering terms. And for the little I could understand, they did it, because I'm not an engineer myself, um, they did it by this big data, not a term they used, approach to endless random, random simulation. They start with an intuition borrowed from nature, because they have to start somewhere. And so they take a model from nature, because that, in a sense, it is an ideological choice. They start with that, but where they start from is to some extent irrelevant, because from that arbitrary starting point, they initiate a process of endless random variations. And they don't know which one is good and which one is bad, but they will see on the screen that most of them will break under a certain load, and a few will not. And so, survival of the fittest, they dump those that break, and they restart with the one that don't, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end, they end up with a structure which is probably not the best, but it is good enough with regard to what they had in mind. Now, the problem is, why is it that this structure stands up and many other they discarded do not. Can we express that in, uh, with a notion of causality, with a formula which makes sense to our mind? No, we can't. We just know that it works and many others don't. But the process of trial and error whereby they arrived to that point does not even in this case give birth to the traditional artisanal sense of intuition. But from making and breaking, you, you kind of get the inner, get the hang of it, the way the artists and traditionally did. And you understand, in a sense, intuitively or romantically, that it is better if you tweak, tweak it this way rather than if you tweak it the other way, et cetera, et cetera. Apparently, this did not even happen. It was pure trial and error. And at the end, they stopped because they had to start somewhere, they had to stop somewhere. That was not the best, but it was good enough for what they had to do. But this is not, this is something that to a traditional engineer trained in any school of engineer, and engineer until 20 years ago, this would be anathema. This is the, the negation of our way of conceiving modern science. And yet it works. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it works. Um, well, I think we just ran out of time. So thank you very much, Mario. <laughs> there's always hope. I think there's always hope, especially with people like you around. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and uh, we may join you back at 1.30. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to continue the speculative thoughts, even push further those um, theories and, and thoughts with, uh, with three presentations, starting 
very sharply at 1.30, so um, you have the opportunity to have one hour break to look for lunch. There's lunch at Chow House. Please be back at, on time at 1.30, and we're promising really exciting um, other talks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>